Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Advanced Kayak Angler Podcast. Um, hope everybody's having a good week so far. Kurt, how you doing, man? Man, I'm doing awesome. How about yourself? Good. I, uh, I was messing around with my kayak today, so I, that, that's always fun. Di- making sure I've got everything ready and, you know, I started tying on a, every The few things I've ordered have come in for the Harris Chain event, so I started tying on a couple of things because... Uh, next two weekends, I got a bunch of stuff going on. I'm not going to be able to get out. So I'm like, I'm in, I'm in game mode now. I'm, I'm starting to actually get ready for the event. So I'm, I'm excited. I got one more order for like two baits that I want that I'm like, I have to have for the Harris chain. And I thought I had them, but I cannot find them. Don't you hate that? Like, I know I have these baits someplace in my garage. I know they're there. But now I have to order some more and buy them because I cannot find them because I'm trying to rig up for them, man. I was doing the same thing you were. I was ripping off my leaders, you know, get making sure my braid was still good on the couple rods I'm, that I was worried about. Uh, and a lot of that stuff, like I have my own Florida, like a couple of big gallon Ziploc bags that are, just have a bunch of Florida baits and like a little box because Florida is so specific, you know, like the colors and some of the baits just work down there where – I just don't throw them that much anywhere else, you know. You know, I actually don't know. You know, I haven't fished in Florida enough to learn uh, those colors and those baits yet. You know, I, I'm this is only my second time fishing in Florida this year, so it's See, it's still a learning curve for me. I mean, for me, it's always been June bug, and I I don't throw a lot of their stuff, but missile baits they have a color called Love Bug. It's something that um, there was an old Harris Chain event. Chad Morgan Thaler, who's no longer on the Elite Series, there was a show where he was talking about that color. I think he got second at an Okeechobee event. And I went to Okeechobee not long after that and destroyed him on that color. So, you know, a little tip there. If if you like missile baits, that love bug color, it's it's legit in Florida. I'm writing this down right now, actually, in my head. (laughs) It's it's kind of like a... It's almost like, I don't know, it's like red, redder on one side, and then the other side's June bug, I think. It's it, it's it's a really weird combination, but it for some reason they love it down there. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I did read that June bug's like a hot color down there. Yeah, black, blue, you know, that, that tannic water, they like the little bit darker profile to me. But I, I don't throw June bug anywhere else. Just for me, just Florida is the only time I throw it. I'm sure it works to other places. I just... You know, it's not one of my confidence colors. Yeah, I don't put up much unless the water's real dirty. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's go ahead. and we, we have a great guest tonight. Go ahead and bring him on here. Um, the sales manager for Boondocks, Mr. Jeff Little. How are you doing, man? Doing good. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Right. Well, can, first, congrats on the new job. I know you were with Torquedo forever, and now been watching all these videos of you, you know, working with uh, Boondocks, and it seems like, a great fit for what you do yeah can we go back to june bug though june bug will work on the uh <laughs> on the title potomac but black with blue flake is is good everywhere like yeah. my color selection that's you know all my z-men stuff that like kurt you're you're at fault for really sending me down that path initially with the z-man stuff um I carry a lot of green pumpkin, uh, sometimes a green pumpkin with the blue flake um, and and black with the blue. But yes, June bug does work on the title Potomac. And they, um, they have a couple of like gold golden shiners and they have uh, tilapia down there. I mean, there's there's a couple of things that it's not forage where I live here in Alabama, but down there, you know, tilapia colors and golden right. shiners are they work well, too. What is a tilapia color? Carry, a gray, a white? Uh, it's kind of like June. It's it's almost like a bluegill, except it's got. Um, I don't. I've never seen one in the wild. I've eat, eaten them, and I've been down there, and I've seen big giant beds. I didn't know what they were, and somebody's like, "That's tilapia beds." Right. I, I didn't know that either. Um, redfish toad is the other color that I always have, and it's it's. I guess Z Man made it thinking you know for for speckled trout and and redfish but uh smallmouth love that color in the scented jerk shad the diesel minnow anything just redfish toad is a is a favorite but 
but yeah, I've been having fun uh, digging into all the different um, different Boondocks product. I mean, I was a I was just like with Torquedo. I was a customer before I was an employee, I, and I was that way with. Uh, I mean, I love the landing gear in particular. Yeah. I've put landing gear on on all sorts of of different boats, including inflatables. Um, but you know, they were they're for sure in need of, of videos that explain it, explain the need for it and and why you would buy the you know purchase the product, but then hey, here's your step by step of how you do the install. Um, and you know, I'm just every every couple of weeks I run down to Thomasville, North Carolina, where all this stuff is made. Um, and pick up some stuff and uh, and bring it back home and and do do rigging videos. Um, one of them was, and I've done a lot with the console here recently, uh, which is basically uh, an extrusion. Um, it, it's basically track that's that you can um, put across you know the front of your foot well, but I've actually put them behind the seat as as a place to to mount a bunch of yak attack stuff. Um, we changed it. I did the video with with Chad Brinkley, who's who's really the guy that, that started Boondocks. And uh, you know, we did that, and I I kind of hesitated on on publishing that video because I struggled a little bit with with drilling the hole and getting the track nut in there, and you hold it down with a file, and then you have to thread up through you know the bottom to get it to grab with this with the riser, which the riser is really cool. Um, the finished product is great, but I struggled with it a little bit. And I'm like, if I'm struggling with it, you know, and, and we published it and immediately people were, you know, saying, you know, it'd be really cool if, you know, it, 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 what they described was basically it being slotted. Uh, and that, and there was a cap that was a little, it, it was just tough to get on there. And, uh, we went back and I was like, these are the, these are the comments we're getting. Can we fix this? They're like, Oh yeah, let's go up to the machine shop, grab one of those. We'll go up there in uh, the, you know, Abby up there. We'll write a code and zip, zip. Here it is. How's this? I'm like, that's awesome. Like we don't have to wait. Like we don't have to like, that's the great thing is that you, we get to make changes quickly and take that customer feedback and, and, and fix things and uh all of the the consoles going out from i think yesterday forward all of the ones that were shipped have the slot and have the new cap so it's uh it's nice to not have to um and i say this in one of the videos it's the truth you don't have to wait on a on a shipment coming in from china i don't see china in the video but that's what i mean when it you have to wait for something coming in from overseas to change your product it's made here. Um, just like Akatech stuff, just like Crescent Kayaks and so many of our other, you know, kayak manufacturers catch made here, like support your American manufacturing and in, in kayak fishing, please, if you can. We got a lot of really good ones. I wonder why more companies don't do it. Like you have this great feedback loop, especially with social media nowadays of your customers are telling you exactly what's wrong with your product. And it's crazy how you see some of these brands, they keep the same flaw and the same thing over and over and over. And did you because not understand there was a problem? Because you can get it made in China and pay very little, but you have to order this, this big amount. And, and once you got it, hope you like it, you got a bunch of them and, and you've paid relatively little for it. Um, yeah. And I was just having a conversation with a small manufacturer in Cincinnati, totally not kayak related, but what you just said, Jeff, it hit the nail on the head. And he was is struggling with trying to produce a product cheap enough to be sold in retail stores, yet he needs to be innovative because he's a small manufacturer and he's to respond to his customers in a timely manner. And he's been struggling with it, and he finally just went all in on American Made for it, and dumped all his Chinese stuff. And he's just he just says he's going to charge a little bit more, but he's and, and what you just said is that quick turnaround. When they found a problem or a way to improve it, they could immediately address it, and within a week, it was hitting the stores. So Where before it would be almost a year out because you got to design it. 
they have to build it, they have to ship you one to look at it, you say yes, then then they build it, and then it comes on the slow sh ship to the U.S. I will, I will give you a little bit of background um, on what what Boondocks is. It's a it is a brand under a company called Bartimaeus by Design, which the center plate of that business is making uh, manufacturing metal pieces that they sell to furniture companies where they're making a finished piece of furniture, but maybe they need the leg or the frame or, or a hinge or, or whatever it is, a pipe that they make metal pieces for the furniture industry. Um, Chad, who started Boondocks, it's his father that started Bartimaeus and he, he started the business to wrestle back um, that business from from overseas, from from China, and to get Americans working again in 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 you know the furniture capital, you know what was the furniture capital of the world? It's still a lot of furniture you know being manufactured in that Thomasville High Point. Anyways, that is the that is the DNA of this company. Is hey, we're going after things. You if you want if you want five of them made, or you want 5,000 of them made, we can do it. Um, whereas if you, in, you know, I've, you see it in, in components of, of fishing kayaks or accessories here and there, you know, it's, if somebody's designed something and it works, you'll see a copycat version of it within time. If it's a really successful product. And I used to work for a company that happened to. So it is their, it is their MO. They look at what is, you know, what sells well that someone's already done the, the engineering work and, and the design and even the marketing and created a market and then just copy it. And, you know, it's, they're good at it. You know, the, the culture of, of copycat, they're, they're very good at it. And we eat it up as consumers. Cause, oh, we'll just get that. Um, the only way you you outpace it is by continually um, innovating and making new you know new stuff. And I'm happy to be working with um, you know with a company that's quick, make make changes, make it better. Uh, and and hopefully you know we're going to couple that with some collaborative co-marketing stuff with the Ack Attack because it's another great American like injection molding plastic you know, in Farmville, Virginia, I kind of coupled the, you know, the, the, um, the console with the risers, the, the update to that product with, you know, it'd be cool if this, we could take it off real quick. What do I need? Oh, I, I need some mighty bolts and some low pro wing knobs. Let's stop in at, at uh, Yak Attack. And, and we actually did the, the update video there. Um, yeah, if I, you guys I haven't seen it, it's, it's on the little stuff YouTube yeah. channel or on the boondocks mm -hmm. channel, the, yeah. It was awesome. You were able to just drive right over there and, you know, yeah. Yeah, go solve the problem right there. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, this, this job is sort of a, um, a rigging revival for me uh, in terms of I'm getting my hands on, I, I hate to admit it. And, and I don't want my wife to hear the number. I've, I think 22 or 23 different boats. I'm getting ready to buy Jody Queen's, pro angler when he upgrades uh so it'll be 23 or 24 like man uh i got too many but I, but i like like i just finished working on it was the the native ultimate 14 uh so 14 5 solo uh which is a classic a lot of people don't know or understand yeah. how great a boat that is but i've had it and worked on it and rigged it and got the 7.2 mile an hour out of it keto and it, i'm i'm pulling old boats that i haven't messed with in a while out and saying all right let's play around and, and rig this up with this product so but <clears throat> the inflatables is another fun one that i've been rigging with a bunch uh, but you know i'm i'm going from from rigging the same thing, Torquedo Ultralight, Torquedo Ultralight, Torquedo Ultralight on every possible kayak. And and that that really did make it easy for a lot of people to understand how to how to do that install and know what the benefits of the product were. 
uh, to this is a much more diverse set of set of products, you know, and it's fun. And, you know, the, the fun of what I do next is going to, uh, to a bunch of different shops in, in well, should I tell you my list? I want to see if I have it here. Um, I'm doing a dealer visit tour. Uh, everything kayak and bicycle in Gulfport. Great shot. Gulfport, yeah. Massey's in New Orleans. No Week Outfitters, uh, also near New Orleans. The Backpacker, Pack and Paddle, Ship to Shore, Fishing Tackle Unlimited, Roy's Bait and Tackle, Fin Factory, Kerrville Kayak and Canoe, TG Canoe and Kayak, No Bad Days Kayak, Mountain Sports, Mariner Sales. That's my next trip. And what I get excited about is I get to – go hang out with other wrench turners, other people that are, that are rigging stuff that, um, you know, it's always cool to pop in and see Edward Hornsby down in Gulfport and yeah. say, what have you rigged recently? And he's usually got something really creative or cool to show me. So I brewed beer with Ed before. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm from surprise Biloxi, me. So. Yeah. Last time I was there, he was, he cooked, he was cooking, uh, fish tacos with like a snapper he'd caught two days ago for for his employees he's like you gonna stick around for tacos i'm like hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> tacos. i yeah. tried to convince them a while to to build a shop like closer to here before there was one because yeah. it was in, like just a desert of no kayaks i was like how does nobody have a shop here i don't understand right that, they're, they're, we're, we're lucky there is now but i tried to convince them yeah uh, What's your closest shop? Uh, right now it's the Yak Shack. They're in Pelham, one town over. But uh, yep. now we've got, I mean, we've got a few now that are all within the last few years. I mean, there's, you know, like Bucks Island, the yep. team I was just on, they started carrying kayaks. And yeah, there's more now than there ever was. But to be central Alabama, to be a hotbed of fishing, it just, and there was no kayak retailers. It was pretty, you know. Right. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of the economy, right? It, everything is so mail order based that sometimes there are places where there just aren't shops. So that's some of what I've been kind of hashing through, um, and and why are why are individual shops that do the rigging are so important? And there is some of the e commerce, and I don't mean a, a shop that you know has a brick and mortar and does their, um, you know, does online sales on their website, but like the whole Amazon thing is, is a handful. Uh, and I think we just changed our, well, I, let me give you the scenario. <clears throat> Someone walks into a shop and say they're looking at, um, <clears throat> a set of landing gear for the pro angler and they go in there and they see it in the, in the person, you know, who works there, who turns wrenches, talks them through, okay, here's what you need to know. I'm going to walk you through everything. You know, we, we have them in stock um, and I can do the install for you if you don't feel comfortable doing it. Our shop rate is this, but here's what you need to know. And and they go through everything they need to know to, to do that install correctly. And <clears throat> the person kind of hems and haws and, and walks around, looks at some other stuff, and then you see them in the corner. And they're they're pulling it up on Amazon. They're like, oh, yeah. I can get it for ten dollars less. I don't have to pay. It's free shipping. It's ten dollars less. Hey, thanks for your help, man. Check you later. And they don't buy it there. That's a problem. That, that is, is a problem. That's that is a huge good. problem. In and, and it's why you know, good companies have minimum advertised price policies, and you have to police it. You have to, you know, look online and see if people are selling it less than what you tell them that they can sell it for as a dealer. Um, in no place is it more frustrating or or difficult to police than Amazon, because what happens is if you have lots of people selling on lots of dealers selling on Amazon, and here's your minimum advertised price, and one of them says, "I'm gonna drop it down," like just. Three dollars. See if anyone notices. All right, then they bump it back up. Well, for those five days that they had it, three dollars less, they got all the sales. And then maybe another one says, "Oh no, I'm going to go down eight dollars." Right, yeah. and it becomes this race to the bottom. 
and who end up who ends up losing more often is is that shop with that knowledgeable person that knows how to do the work that that helps people know how to do the install educates the consumer they lose and we can't have those shops losing i personally think that's how you combat amazon is by having those really good employees that really know their stuff because you're always going to have that guy who's not going to buy at the shop but by having those good employees you're going to capture the people who are on the edge right they may order it or they may stop and have them install it but then they go and talk to the, that really good employee excited about the product who's knowledgeable about the product i think that's how you have to combat it i mean you know, I, I owned a bike shop for years, and uh, I know you did. About that all the time, man. I mean, there was people that would come in, try on shoes, and then they would just order them online. You know, that stuff happened all the time. But you know, how I combated it at my shop was just by trying to give them the best knowledge possible, so anyone who was willing or close to buying would buy. <clears throat> I think that's what sets apart a lot of shops is the it is but you, but you need that sale to survive yeah, you do. as a dealer it is. absolutely um and i'm not anti-amazon per se you know i just i just know that when you have a minimum advertised price policy that's not policed um and, and that's some of what we're we're cleaning up you know what we're what we're going after and you know one of the policies that we changed is that and you won't see it this way yet because this is new, uh, but that Boondocks is the only one that will sell on Amazon and uh-huh. and we will have it at the minimum advertised price. Uh, we want people looking at it and saying, yep, there it is. Oh, same price is here, but I got to pay shipping here. I'm already here. Let's buy it at the dealer. So that's what we want. And it's it's hard to control that. So. I don't know. That's too much business and not enough rigging. But it, it's what I'm. It's what no, I'm I, dealing I, with. I in absolutely. This, in this new I mean, role. I've, I've worked in retail. I've worked in different places. I, I I never thought about the pricing that way and why they did it. I mean that 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 makes total sense. Yeah. And it puts a it puts a extra burden on the companies too. This you know people think that the online sales is like just it's all like one-sided like it's helping the companies but it's putting the burden on the company now to police their own pricing for their right. deal yeah you know, that takes time i mean and, and that company's paying someone to do that and you have to be vigilant just like you said you're gonna have to do it you have to look at it like almost every day to make sure that someone doesn't pop up in there and so torquito was was notoriously good about policing their minimum advertised price policy and once you get it going in that direction and you and you you know you you give someone a pass first time but you let them know hey next time you do it we're done selling product to you um you'll see that that the other dealers will will call you out on it to the company before anything else but mm-hmm. but if it's not policed, if it's not, and that's some of the work that we got to do, then yeah, it's a free for all. It's a race to the bottom in the the independent shop that you know that does installs, does kayak rigging. You know, if if that's that's their bread and butter, and it's not online, it's not Amazon sales. They you know they lose out, and we can't have them losing out. And and there are shops that do both. I'm not discrediting you know shops that that. Great. You do. I mean, there's a lot of them that do both and they're smart to do both. Um, but, you know, you got to you got to have a level playing field. That's what we're doing. That's what we're but working I, on. We're not there yet. Whenever you were talking about Yak Attack and there's a lot of different companies in the space, especially companies that are, your, that are kind of partners like Yak Attack is for you all. How do you not overlap products? It seems like, you know, everybody like you have catch boondocks, yak yeah. attack, and and you can make a lot of similar products trying to solve the same problem. Yeah. How do you still be a good partner and not overlap, or does that get weird? Um, you communicate, in in it ends up being. I mean, you know, 
sometimes you agree, <laughs> hey, we're both going to make a, a product X and we're, we're going to compete. I, I actually, here's the analogy. This works perfect with you. So I film a lot of people uh, that, you know, I filmed you, Kurt. I filmed so many people that do well in this sport and end up on the stage at the end of a kayak fishing tournament. And what I see over and over again, there's people in, and I think there's some people that look at me like they're very clicky. They just, you know, they exclude. Well, now I think there's, there's this, Hey, you're, <laughs> you're on this level and I'm on this level and there's this respect. And what I see is in pre-fishing, they'll pass each other and they'll exchange some information, but some of the most critical information is, Hey, you, you, you saw where my truck was parked. Yeah. That cove, like the next cove around there, that's my day one spot. Okay, good. Noted. Uh, I, that was like my, my third spot I was going to hit maybe, but like, now that I know you're there, cool. Uh, my best spot is, is where I just came out of. And that person will say, okay, you turn, let me go find some other water. Cause they don't want to share water. They don't want to be in the same place tournament morning saying, oh crap, I got to share it with this awesome stick. And if it does happen, I've seen this on tournament day where they both show up at the same you know, opening to the cove and they say, well, you want the left bank or the right? I want the right. Okay, I'll take the left. It, and it's just this, this communication and mutual respect sort of thing. It doesn't mean they're not going to compete. They're there to compete. But the communication and the the sh sometimes sharing of pattern, sharing of knowledge in, in just um, having that mutual respect. The flip side of that, say someone's winning after day one and everyone knows where they are. Everyone knows the word gets around. He's on this coat and he's on fish. The Chinese manufacturer shows up on day two, pulls right up and says, hey buddy, we're gonna wreck them today. That's what they do. <laughs> so, uh, does it analogy work for you? So you communicate. You, you respectfully one. communicate with each other. And in, in, I think in the case with, um, you know, with, with boondocks and the Yak Attack, Yak Attack's really good at a lot of things, but they're the best at injection molded plastic. And we're really good at doing all sorts of things with metal. And um, <clears throat> there's some things that, you know, we could, we could make, um, you know, we could come up with a metal low pro wing knob, for instance. Are we going to? No. We're going to buy them from the Akatech because they make the best ones. So there's also that OEM relationship that, you know, you you hope to, to find those win-win collaborative situations. Um, because we do have a a uh, a common enemy of of uh, you know stuff made over there for really cheap that is just a copycat version of a hey I know where you were fishing on day one I'm going there. It's it's that disrespectful you know it, and the culture of it is they don't they don't see it that way they say oh we honor you by you make the best and we're gonna it's a compliment. Yeah. Do you think it's a compliment? It's it's parasitic, but <laughs> culturally they think, oh, we're we're complimenting you by making one just like yours. And making a bunch of money at the same time yeah. all yeah. of your design, yeah. Right. But, I mean, China, it, it, it is amazing how good they have gotten at copying stuff. Yeah. But that's what's the beauty of of having the relate having the yak attack and Boondocks and, and Catch and, and everyone else because these guys, I've, I've seen more innovation in the last like two years in kayak fishing than I did than I saw in the, the previous 10 years. Right. You know, because you know, it, you remember the day you was like, making you, stuff out of people. Is, is innovating. Like that, that's the strength of, of our, our U.S. manufacturing because we, we do the sport, we know what's needed, and we listen to. You know, it's uh, it's it's not, you know, like our our workforce needs to be paid more than what people need to be paid in it you know, overseas. So we got to make better stuff. We got to yeah. 
the next best thing. And we got to keep making it because we will be copied. <laughs> so it's just listening to this thing today where not, not to get on China, but they like they have a, you know, their one child, one child policy rule for so long. Now they board, they aborted so many girls that it's just all like half of the population is men and they'll never be able to get married more than like six, 70% of the population is men and 30% women. I just, yeah, they're over there copycat and stuff, but they're sad. They're lonely men. They don't have anything <laughs> else to do. You know, I, I think there's a lot of good things that are, you know, that, that can be made there, but just the overall culture of, of, of copycat is just, just as a consumer, think through it. Think through it. I know everyone's got a budget, but, um, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's good to support your fellow Americans. That's it. And sometimes buying quality, you're actually saving money in the long run. You're buying it once instead of buying it twice or three times because it's a lower quality. Right. Yeah, my boondocks, uh, like the, you know, the tailgate thing. The T-bone. What, what is it? It's called the a T-bone. T-bone, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I have an orange T-bone. And I, I bought the pads that came from y'all, came from boondocks. I've had it forever, you know, for six seven years that thing will last me a lifetime yeah so that was an example of a product that came from chad brinkley who's you know who who started it um it was one of those products i think he fished with some of the guys that worked the uh you know work the shop floor he kayak fished with them and they just made stuff that they're like we need this like getting the boat you know, the kayak from the truck to the water is, is no fun and putting it on carts. And like, I think we can, you know, and I think back then there, there aren't carts like we have now, like the carts that we have now are, are many generations better than what was back there. And, and it was just a smart design of like, Hey, let's, let's put wheels on here and let them stay on there. Um, the T-bone was the same thing. Were there bed extenders? Yeah. Uh, but the welds, were failing and you'd hit stuff and and they were done but to have a have that curved design you know if you do bump into something it's it's just gonna ride up it it's fine uh you know and it's and it's light aluminum too yeah so yeah. but we got a lot of other cool things coming and it's you know it, it, some of it's gonna be I don't know how much I want to talk about it, but it's not all going to be on the kayak. You know, I'm just going to say that it's going to be things that help the traveling tournament angler or not even a tournament angler, just someone that likes to go on road trips and go kayak fishing and likes to, uh, you know, save a few bucks, not getting a hotel room or Airbnb. You want to, you want to, stay right where you are with your vehicle and stay with your gear for gear security purposes and saving, you know, a few bucks and just being right there on the water. Like we're going to make things for that. And, and I'm, I'm really motivated to, to make things like that. Cause I want it. Cause I, I'm on the road. Um, last year was an anomaly. I wasn't on the road as much. Um, but I think the year before I, I pegged it at a uh, 43% of, of, my nights I slept somewhere than other than my own bed. So in and a lot of times, I mean, I went through that list of dealers that I'm going to go see and uh, you know, I free form. I don't always know where I'm going to end up each night. I, in fact, I rarely know what town I'll be in and to be able to have the freedom of, all right, pull the key out of the ignition and uh, hop in the back conk out and know that, Hey, I don't have to be looking through the, uh, you know, the blinds there to see, all right, is, is my kayak still on the, on the trailer or the, or the truck? I've stayed in a number of places where I just don't sleep well, or bring all my rods, everything of value in the, in the, um, in the vehicle, I bring it into the hotel room. That's not fun. So to be able to stay with, your you know your vehicle and all your gear that's something we're moving in that direction uh and i'll let your your you know 
uh, your mind wander with what that is. Yeah, well, there there was a couple other products I saw y'all had, like the uh, adjustable rigging stand and yep. the gear tree. The adjustable yeah. rigging stand, that's the one people have been made, making out of wood. Greg Blanchard has one out of wood. I'm yeah. not DIY enough to make one. And you actually made one, so now I don't have to <laughs> build right. some janky Frankenstein thing. Now I can just <laughs> buy one. build really Moon nice Rock. janky Frankenstein things. I've seen a number of them, especially kayak shops, like to, to be able to have something on casters to roll it around. And, and you know, they're, <clears throat> they're working on something, but then a truck comes in and they're like, we got to move this out of the way. All right. To have something on wheels is is nice. That's what that is. Uh, yeah. And there, there's ones that come with the casters. And then I chose the one that came with the the big, uh, I think the Railblazer wheels, like the, the you know, the off-road wheels, if you will. Um, you know, it, it helps you load it on, a, you know, in the back of the truck, too, just to already have it at that level. Um, the the gear tree is is pretty cool because uh, you can put all sorts of different accessories on there. So I think it holds like seven different rods. Is it seven or nine? I can't remember. Like it's got a, it's got, you know, slot for all your rods. It's got a thing for your, your paddle uh, and your PFD, <clears throat> but it's also got different accessories. Like there's one for the Mirage drive, yeah. uh, which I was just talking to Brandon Waugh out in, um, He's he's up at Next Adventure in Oregon. He got one of the uh, the ones for the Mirage Drive. So it, it was it's this metal piece that that you can put on the wall, or you could put it on the um, <clears throat> the gear tree that you can just hang your Mirage Drive right on there. It's not just laying on the floor like something you you'll trip over. Um, there's one for the um, for some of the other you know. There's another one that does all you know most of the other pedal drives. Uh, you know, so and I asked Chad, I'm like, can you can you please do one for a torpedo? He's like, Yeah, we'll get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> Need a torpedo hanger. Yeah. I whenever I saw that with the Mirage Drive, I was thinking, I mean, I have a rod holder, but there's a lot of the you know, the Mirage Drive. If I could put my my motor on there, you know what? I, I mean, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Because they, they just <clears throat> one sits on my freezer and one's like, you know, on a shelf. They're they're just not well organized yeah they're so awkward unless you yeah. unless they're like in their cradles you know what i mean or in right. some way to hang them it's just yeah. so awkward yeah. storms so this is this stuff is like it, it, it's some of this product you're almost like wondering why no one else has done it yeah you know it's like you guys are the ones come bringing it to the to the forefront here well <clears throat> It's it's listening to with open ears to people that you know say, can we come with something that that solves this problem? And and that's really what I'm hoping the the YouTube channel for Boondocks is is going to be a um, just a you know an idea you know a place to to just get ideas, try them out, and then get them to market and. Uh, and then continually improve them, you know? So, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the console is, is the fun one that I've been playing with here recently. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, a lot of different things you can do with that besides, you know, putting two graphs on it. You want to put two graphs on it? Cool. You want to put it behind you and put, you know, some cup holders and, and I tend to, to put a lot of my rods uh, horizontal behind me, facing back with the um, the um, Omega Pro rod holders, Omegas and Omega Pros, uh, because I end up, you know, overhanging branches. I, I go underneath them, and I don't want things sticking up, hitting them. So, yeah, um, yeah, I know the I know Kurt, your your pro angler handles that by putting them down in front of you. A lot of boats that do that, but um, you know, it, it's. I like them pointed back because if I go underneath stuff, I'm not, I'm not damaging rods. So, um, so what are you guys working on rigging? Are you, you have a boat that you're, I know Kurt, you've been doing some, some different stuff with your electronics and your, the batteries. What's your rigging been here recently? Man, I have, uh, just basically re-rigged my whole, 
PA over the winter time. I changed up my torpedo steering from the Tim Piercy handle steering to his foot steering, which I'm really glad I went to foot steering. I wish I would have gone earlier. Now that I've gotten it and, and seen how it doesn't interfere with my deck layout. Right. Uh, you know, and putting my electronics on there and really taking that to the next level. I went to two fish finders and I got two panoptics transducers pointing, one pointing down, one pointing perspective and networking all that stuff together and getting all the electronics and wiring squared away. It has just been kind of like a journey, you know, I mean, there's no other way to put it. It right. did take a long time to, to get it to where it's at. And it's finally clean too. You know, most of these times it's like a rat's nest when I wire something, you know, it's functional, but there's just like extra wire and there's just tons of it. And, and it's just been, yeah, I'm really happy. I'm this, this, this has been like, I'm really proud of my boat this year. <laughs> I'm like really, really proud of it. How it's turned out. So my, my lasting impression of, of your, your pro angler is that uh -oh. it looks like someone stole a cart from the parking lot at the Piggly Wiggly, threw it through the plate glass window of the tackle shop and just grabbed all the plastics they could <laughs> just, just loaded in that shopping cart and just, just ran with it. Like that's that's your front hatch <laughs> you know it's funny you say that because this year i have i made a commitment not to have my bot my my pro angler look that way like i have, I have my lures that i have on my deck I, i'm using different bags for certain things so i'm trying to keep it organized you know we'll see how long that lasts because man suggestion. once I start big suggestion get some of the yak attack track packs you can get mm, eight, maybe nine packs of soft plastics in those and just keep one of them close to you that has the plastics you know you're going to use and then keep one that's empty. And that's your discards. That is your, hey, I'm pulling this jig off. It isn't, you know, I need a fresh one or whatever it is. Like, hey, they're not eating the buzz bait. Throw it in there. Whatever, you know, everyone needs a junk drawer. Everyone needs a discard bin that doesn't just become uh man i just lost that down through the the drive hole you know no yeah. give give yourself like that. For those boxes man i like that idea yeah. yeah so the last well the native um ultimate that i set up i i had one of those on either side and and i think i had the camera mount the um the, the bigger rotor grip for the net and maybe a retractor for my pliers. And, and that setup I think was perfect for a throw and go rig. That's all the tackle I brought two of those, those track packs. Now understand who I just got like balloons. balloons. I don't know how I got balloons. <laughs> Anyone know about balloons? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so that was weird. But uh, yeah, I got balloons. Um, <laughs> so yeah, being able to to do this, you know, uh, this throw and go type setup and, and carry minimal tackle is, uh, you know, it's a thing. But the key is to have it within arm's reach. So just my suggestion, you to Kurt, just get get two of those. Get two of them with two bases and. You know, keep it because I, I feel like if if I can't reach it quickly, it's dead weight. Yeah, I really believe that. Yeah, I'll tell you what I I, I would love Boondocks to make underneath my seat, my pro angler. I've got two big flambeau bins. They're long and they fit. You don't have to write it down. Yeah, Damn. but the like um. <laughs> and there are bins that I keep all my soft plastics in. So one side primarily worms, the other side's like, you know, craws and some swim baits. And I have to take these two bins out and then put them back in. If if there were like a box, because some other companies make like things that go underneath your seat. If there was a box where those two rolled out and they were on rollers and I could just 
move my leg over and then grab my plastics rather than having to take that box out from underneath the underneath me and then pick it out from there. If the drawers just slid out and there was two, you know, two from underneath the seat because they fit perfect and they work great. And I'd never have to take it out either. That would be amazing. Should it Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll send you a picture later of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Sketch it out. No, I think I got, I think I got the concept. Um, yeah. I would love a sketch. Seriously. Um, yeah. Keeping your, keeping, keeping things within arm's reach is, is critical. And the track packs do that, but sometimes you need, you know, the under the seat stuff. I know when Bonafide did the, the junk drawer, that was, that was pretty cool. Hobie's always done it with that hatch, you know, right in front of you. Um, that, that is, you know, is perfect. Um, what else you can, you know, you can keep close at hand. I know there's some, um, I think Bonafide has like a, um, a thing that goes on the back of the, the seat back. Uh, I know a lot of people just stuff a, you know, a Plano box, like in the straps back there. I've done that. Um, but yeah, and you know, it, lots of companies do, of kayak companies do little pouches on the side, obviously, Hobie's done that. Uh, yeah. Crescent has their little little zipper pouch on either, either side, which is nice. Um, a lot of companies do that, but having it in a way that that gives gives that person the flexibility of of hate. I don't think I want it here. I want to move it here. Giving them the the freedom to to position it wherever is is pretty cool. And and for sure, that's what the track packs do. So, I, I probably carry a lot more soft plastics than what most people do too, though. So, <laughs> yeah, I even have a bunch in in the big zippered bags up in the front hatch too. That's where I keep all my big swim beats up there. I mean, I you know my yeah. foot, my dice, all yeah. my fancy JDM stuffs yeah, up there. That's, but that's Kurt's, uh, you know, piggly wiggly cart. <laughs> yeah. At least they're organized, you know. Like I have them; they're in there nice. The, the really crazy thing is that I've watched Kurt do is lift that thing up and put his hand, like dive in there. And be like, I need a, you know, uh, um, the deal colored, you know, the, the worm, right. It, and, and his hand will go in it'll come out and it'll have that color. I'm like, how did he do that? It's organized. Like, it's organized. I know. No, I believe you. I believe <laughs> you. It looks like chaos, but I know that, you you knew where your hand was was going. I get it. I get it. You know, you know, because I've had a couple of those circumstances. I bring so much stuff because you know, there's been two tournaments where I've done very well by digging up a lure that I bought at some show that it just struck me that was like, man, I think it's that weird purple color is going to do it. And dug it out, and that was the one that worked. And, you know, honestly, I've never fished that stuff again, either one of those lures. It just happened to be a spur-of-the-moment thing, and they, it was the right call, you know. And I, it, that's just stuck with me. That's just stuck with me all, for years now. Now I just like, I'm like, well, what if I changed my mind in the middle of the day? I better bring that. Right. The next thing I know, I got my whole front hatch is full. I mean, I just can't help it. So <clears throat> when you use a lot of creative access points, and I just did a video about this. Um, I, I think the thumbnail said uh, says grab it and run or something. How not to trespass while kayak fishing, something like that. Very clickbaity sort of title. But the whole the whole premise of the of the you know of that video was to break down what do you need to how do you organize your stuff? And I think I used a, a crescent light tackle to put three or four rods down in the hull in that that front hatch put my paddle in there um had a big mesh nrs bag that i threw all my loose items but it wasn't much including those track packs and in in my camera bag and had one of the rogue fishing company drag straps that was attached to the front and i pull in understand i was not trespassing but i was also right next to a not in my backyard sort of property owner. And I just, I wanted to move through quick. 
I was legal, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to have a conversation with someone. So having that sort of ability to get in and get out quick, it's so important to, to go lightweight and, and at least to have the ability to, to pare down in your brain. What do I really need? Um, and that day in, in the track pack, I had some of the finesse jigs that we talked about before. Uh, I got some <clears throat> bat wings, Z-Man bat wings. I had some Z-Man sent a jerk shad with the finesse rigging bullets. Um, I had a couple jerk baits. I did bring a, um, I had one spy bait in there. Uh, I think I had a big, I had a, the big blade um, chatter bait. And I think that was about it. And it was enough. It was, it was a, Hey, I'm, I'm fishing the small river. Um, if forced to only have six lures, what are they? Okay. Put those in there. You know, yeah. if, if, if you can get yourself to do that, you can get in and out of more of these, these spots that like forget about anything that you're, you're, you know, you would do with it back in a trailer in. No, it's, it's, you know, it was difficult access, but worthwhile, totally worthwhile. Um, but we all fight that, that, you know, that, oh, what if I don't have this? Oh, and I need this. And I think one of the best ways to do it, you know, where we just accumulate things um, is to have, you know, say you have your black pack or, or whatever it is you organize. I've been using this Lakewood tackle box recently. It's the Sidekick Mini. Uh, and I have two of them. Um, whatever you organize your stuff in, every season, you have to totally empty it out. you got to do it. Because if you don't, you're going to look down in the middle of July and be like, why do I have three pounds of blade baits in here? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you don't, you'll be out there in you know, in late fall and you reach in and be like, yeah, all these top water or this buzz baits, you know, is tangled up in these spinner baits with the big single Colorado that I really need, you know, you accumulate weight and it slows you down. So getting in the habit of figuring out your tackle organization and just honestly go into your garage and just, just upend it, just dump it, just empty it. And then clean your box and and pick out whatever things that you're like, I'm still using this. I'm still using this. This I'm not. Oh, that's missing one of the trouble hooks. I got to rehab that. Go through that stuff and 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 keep it keep it pertinent to the season that you're in. Um, you know, it's it's hard to do. It takes time. It's worth it, though, because then you're then you're not bogged down heavy carrying a bunch of stuff you don't use so yeah. but yes your story about that one bait with that weird purple that's that's what drives us all to carry all of it as much as we can and yeah. <laughs> i'm not discrediting it i mean you had a you had a you know you had a good day with that bait so but i haven't thrown it in years since i've been down there if it, if i hadn't taken it out of my kayak it'd still be in there Right. So, you've been doing this so long. I mean, it, as long as anybody. And like Kurt was saying earlier, how things have kind of progressing and there's so much innovation over the last couple of years. Where do you, speaking of things where carrying less can be more, it seems like more is more and more than more is more. Like, where do you see this sport going if we started off with, you know, like the the ultimate, like that's a you know, tripper or Kilroy, that's, you know, like great canoe to kayak hybrid. And now we have the Blue Sky 360. Where right. where do you think all this is going? Um, I, I do see people on the different trails and just, just in their own fishing outside of tournaments, um, having two different kinds of rigs yeah. and 
and I'm getting ready to go back into the the it should have a trailer rig, which is a you know the the Pro Angler 14. I will have the the landing gear on there, uh, and you know I'm going to put all the electronics on it. Am I dragging that down the hill to the that place where I did the the informal access? No, no. It'll be that ultimate or the light tackle two or and I keep changing it. You know whatever it is or an inflatable. The inflatables are are such an important throw and go, and even more than that, shallow water specialist. That's how much water you need. Hmm. Most kayaks need between five and nine inches. The inflatables, uh, two and an eighth is, is usually what we measure that we start rubbing on. With a Torquedo, you don't even need that. You just need to be wet. <laughs> <laughs> like you need some momentum and, and uh, you know, the 1103 mashing it and it's going to smack into it and roll right over it. Um, the inflatables are, are something that I just see growing more and more as, especially as that uh, throw it over the guardrail and, and, and drag it behind you and run like hell and get to that spot that, that, you know, that no one else is going to try. Um, yeah. They seem to be super popular recently. Like I, I feel like the last two years, they've really taken off. Yeah, and, and so, not only we're starting to see options for rigging those now, right? They're seeing like Yak Attack make the little patches that you glue on. So you know, I mean, this stuff is going to really make them a lot more usable. I mean, I know you you're used to rigging them, Jeff, and you've been into inflatables for a while. But, you know, not every, not everyone's used to them. Not everyone's used to, like, having to glue something on to attach something else. You know, they, they're all so drilled and bolted bolt through plastic. The biggest hurdle, the first hurdle, is people, um, the psychological thing of it's a pool toy. First rock I hit, first time a hook gets near, it's going to go, and I'm going to sink and drown and die. <laughs> they are not pool toys. Um, and and for that reason, some people will never buy them. Uh, I know inflatables from when I, you know, when I had a cataract and took my kids on the, on the Susquehanna and we camp out of it. And I knew that I would set the hook on a jerk bait and it was just a leaf and it comes flying at the tube, smacks into it, bounces 10 feet in the air. And I'm like, yeah, they're good. It's not a hook that's going to get it. Um, but with some of the ones that brag about, oh, it's really, it's it's uh, super lightweight. It's it the hull's only this much. Um, they're not building them thick walled enough for what we do, and for specifically what we do is that we catch fish that come jumping up where they have the the spines or the fins. They think of how many times you 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 bleed here from being finned. Every time that kind of you know, thing hits, hits a thin walled inflatable. It's a super slow leak. That's going to take you probably three days to even notice anything happen, but it's annoying. It's annoying that you're like, man, I want to take that thing out. Every time I got to do it, I, let me find the pump and, and get it back up to the outer tube, three PSI, the center one fifteen or 20 or whatever it is. Uh, usually the center ones, the drop stitch floorings are, they usually hit, hold up better, but you know, I worked with, with Trey at, at Innovative Sportsman and knew, hey, these are the these are the areas where the fish fin punctures happen. You know, let's double wall it. And the Osprey is one that is I, I had one that I think I used for two years before I got a puncture, and I used it thoroughly. Uh and and I know when I got the puncture and I was recklessly abusive with that boat <laughs> truly um and and when it happened i didn't i fished the rest of the day and didn't even notice it and the next morning i go out and i feel it and i'm like ooh, it's soft i'd done it finally and i'm like yeah i know i was dragging i dragging past that you know that boulder someone rolled in front of that access that's still public that shouldn't have been there they're trying to keep people out anyways i knew what i did um but yeah, like two years of using it and it, it didn't happen, you know? So, it, you know, it's sort of like, and Kurt, 
<laughs> this is another analogy that'll work for you, but it's sort of like mountain biking. If you go to some single track in the middle of nowhere, are you going to go out without like without a pump on your on your no? Are you going to have a spare tire or or at least a patch kit? Yeah, it's like that. You have all the benefits of shallow draft, crazy stable. The primary stability on these things is 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 unlike any you know even a super wide kayak you you feel more stable in a in inflatable because it's the physics of compressed gas you just it's like you're walking on a on a dock uh and then the stealth aspect and i <clears throat> i sometimes forget how much of an advantage it is to be in an inflatable if you drop pliers sure it hits that and it just absorbs it but even even like, um, and I noticed this, I was filming Corey Dreyer on Lake Murray. Uh, he was, he was going Good through video, areas. By the way. Huh? Good video, by the way. Yeah. All right. So I watched it. Yeah. The interview 10 year retrospective on kayak fishing tournaments. Um, mm -hmm. I kept, I kept my distance to film him and I was was like why wouldn't you have caught that one like okay i didn't say anything i'm like after a while i'm like dude there were three big fish here like why don't you spend more time he's like yeah, i only saw some like 14s and 15s i'm like no dude there were big ones he's like really and he'd come back in he's like i don't see him i'm like neither do i but they were here and at some point we get to a you know i let him go a little bit and i'm looking at this fish and i'm like i'm gonna let him go and i just want to watch this thing this is a beautiful specimen of a huge largemouth bass that just keeps you know coming up underneath the stock and sitting in one spot so it's a it's you know it's a pre-spawn female it's like yes yeah, this, this looks about right you know and eventually i'm like dude come back here and catch this fish he's like is it a good one i'm like it's at least six all right and it does its same route it comes up underneath the dock turns left and parks right in front of like where the rip wrap and the corrugated like metal bulkhead like she goes to her spot and he lets out Corey lets out with holy that's way more than six jeff and i'm like okay you want to catch it he's like now nah, i'm gonna save that for tournament morning and i think he actually caught it you know i think it was i think it was a good fish but it, it occurred to me afterwards that I'm like, why did I see all those fish and he didn't? And it was days after that I'm like, maybe it's that I'm an inflatable. Maybe the whole slap on a on a rotomolded molded boat, they they hear that and know something. But when it when it hits a balloon, it just absorbs it. There's no reverberation, no, no hull slap. I just know, you know, especially in in shallow, low, clear conditions, and in, in where I'm, I'm, you know, yes, when you when you hit a rock, there, it makes no noise, but it's it's more than that. It's it's the water noise, it's the hull slap that um, keeps you quiet. But it's you know, <clears throat> all those advantages: shallow draft, stealth, stability. Um, <clears throat> Don't make it an everything boat. I don't want to take my inflatable out into Lake Erie with Chuck Earls into seven footers. No, I was in a hard boat for that. I wasn't doing that with an inflatable. Right? Another crazy video. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Chuck's crazy and my crazy kind of get together, and there's a synergy of eh, let's let's do this. Thirty-seven degree water. Let's go find some walleye. We didn't. We got skunked. But we tried seven they were, it was seven like it was disappearing in between waves they were not yeah. they were just on the edge of breaking um, yeah it was crazy but but she had a hard boat for that and and honestly he was in uh i think back then he was in the predator mm -hmm. and i was in the jackson take two which handled it pretty well not as well as the predator predator is a good big water boat um but I, I look at opportunities like that. I'm like, that's that's kind of what I, what I want to be back in a pro angler. It's it's great for that. Like that's a good option for going out there. Um, it's all, a out of NAR. NAR is another great big water boat option. Um, 
but now nah, I'm going to get Jody's Jody's old pro angler pre pre-installed mojo and <laughs> <laughs> lots of river rash, but you know, I'll enjoy rigging that thing up. Like put it up, put it up on its nose and all these shaky heads and jigs and <laughs> wobble heads will come. come out. He knows how to clean a boat out. Here's the thing though. I, I will know that when I, when I get that from him, everything is adjusted. Everything is, is in tip top shape because he's, if it could have been broken, it's broken. It's, it's been broken and he's fixed it and he's fixed it. Right. That's, that's part of why I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get a, get a well-worn, but, but solid boat, you know, it's, and you know, it's, it's far from used up. So, but yeah, Jody's, Jody's a heck of a rigger too. Jody's the kind of person that will tear it apart and put it back together to understand it and probably call someone and say, you, you, you know, that designs things saying you should have done this. <laughs> pull apart and put back together a 360 drive. Yeah. And that's, and that's about as complicated as it gets in the kayak world. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, he's got the brain for that, that, <laughs> that, that, you know, just smart hands on you know you know practical engineer in his in in his you know who he is so but, but yeah i'll look forward to that when i'm done with the um that mississippi louisiana texas dealer thing i'll be going um, I'm actually going to pull a trailer full of product and actually save a couple dealers, uh, you know, shipping costs on, on some of that stuff, which they need the help. Um, and then I go, you know, back to North Carolina and then go see, see Jody up in, uh, Bluefield. So it'll be good. The Yank Shack could use a couple of T-bones, Try, drop yeah. a couple off to him while, okay. while you're there. Jessica and Allen. Okay. I'll swing by and say hi. Yeah. Good people. So what else? What what else? Is there anything else with rigging that we're missing? Anything that like what's what's one thing that you see a lot of people do wrong with rigging? And you're just like, why are you doing that? That's not right. Um let me go back to the inflatables for a second, because I did talk about, you know, the the perception of it's it's a pool toy. And that's a hurdle that people won't get over. The the one, you know, the innovative sports one has the double the double layered uh, in the right areas to make it super durable. Um, the second part is is making it riggable. And when I first did this with the, um, I think it was a Star Rival Fish, which was an NRS product. Uh -huh. I put those those Yak Tech switch pads, like you know every. 18 inches and use the, you know, use the GT 175 as little bridges in between. And that's really where the whole thing of um, my working with trade innovative sportsman came about. He's like, man, why are you doing this? Like, we just, you put four of them on there and uh, we'll get some, you know, some track extrusion, slap it on there and we're good to go. All right, we'll, we'll do that. And that's kind of where it started, but making an inflatable riggable the same way that we like it to be riggable with our rotor molded boats that you just, you know, Hey, we just start drilling holes wherever and put stuff. You can't do it with an inflatable. So what you get with that, that style boat with the Osprey is it's, it's a, it's a blank canvas. Like you have, track everywhere you want to put motors on it you want to put depth finders on it you want to put you know rod holders or or anything like you can put it you have track in a box around the whole thing or really running the sides but he he'll he'll put them you know you can get the the side runners as well so that rigability of the inflatable is is really what's what's key and I think a lot of people look at the other inflatables and say, well, that one's only, you know, thousand bucks and, and the Osprey's 2000. Okay. 
I actually did a, um, I rigged the, not the star rival fish, but the one that came after it was the CUDA 126 at Delaware Paddle Sports. By the time we put everything on there, and I'm not even talking about like the motor, I don't mean accessories, just put the track on it. It was, I think it was up to like $2,300. So you're going to pay for, you know, either you're going to do a lot of the work yourself with, with putting a lot of stuff. Even if you do that, you're just, you're, you're going to end up paying more because you think that, oh, it's a thousand dollar boat. Okay. You got to do a lot to it to get it up to what, what the Osprey is. So, um, but you know, there's, it comes back though to two different approaches and two different styles of kayak fishing. And it is the, the all in with the electronics and you're, you're bringing in the boat that has everything or you're going more in the direction of the minimal. And I don't mean minimal, like, you know, the, the native that I rigged up is, is set up the native ultimate 14, five lightweight, but I got two anchors on there. Uh, I could easily throw a, de a depth finder on there. Um, you know, a lot of rod holders in the console and, you know, I got a lot going on there, but it's still set up to be lightweight. So your heavyweights and your lightweights, you're all in on the electronics and, and motors and everything else. And then, yeah, no, you know, and I, I do have the motor bracket on the, uh, you know, on the ultimate, but I don't always take it. Like I've fished with it twice since doing that that rigging that I'm like, eh, I'm just going to throw it in here and, uh, and leave the motor in the truck. Cause I'm, I'm going from here to there and I'm going to fish that area of the river and then come back and then hit a different wow. spot. So, you know, I think it's gonna, I think it's going to split more in that direction and you'll have people that, that carry one of each, you know, carry your ramp boat and you carry your lightweight throw and go. And you know, I think, I think, I think we kind of started as a sport with that throw and go because we didn't have all this stuff. We didn't have the, you know, <laughs> the depth finder mounts for forward facing sonar and, and, and landing gear and, and just everything. We didn't Motors, have that. Yeah. You know, we started with, you know, ocean kayak prowlers and wilderness systems tarpons and and you know just basic wreck boats and they're i think they're still appropriate here and there i do hope we come back to more boats that are um that are easier to paddle i think wow. we've i think we've swung so far in the direction of a super wide hey it looks stable therefore that's the one i want to get um there is some danger in that you know, people, people buy a boat cause they, eh, that's one I'll never flip. Okay, buddy. But if you do, you're screwed. If you haven't practiced reboarding and, and flipping back into that. So, um, <clears throat> that is something though, that I'll be, um, I, before starting this, this job with, uh, boondocks, I took the, uh, I recertified as an ACA instructor. I did that. I got certification as an ACA instructor in 2001 and I used that, uh, it was a whitewater instructor certification. I used that as the basis for my kayak fishing classes I did on the Potomac and Shenandoah and Juniata and Susquehanna. And I did some down on the James and the new, um, I did 10 years of kayak fishing classes. Uh, but the framework of that was the paddling, uh, instruction. And, you know, the whitewater maneuvers and everything else. Uh, I'm coming back to doing that. And I actually uh, roped in some folks like Drew Certified, Drew Gregory and Russ Snyders and Wade Clements with uh, with the Ack Attack, uh, Dustin with Raccoon Creek Outfitters. Uh, although he's had certification before, I think he he's another one that, that re-upped. And then Kevin uh, with Kaku Kayak was in the class. Um, Fletch Griffin 
is an ACA instructor and uh, Jameson Redding did it. There's Joff Luckett, who's actually going to be the the kayak fishing endorsement. Like the um, he's going to be an instructor trainer at some point. So, but yeah, I mean, ACA has come back to kayak fishing to, to, um, you know, there, there's someone behind all of it. It's Andrea White, who, under, who is a ACA instructor, mostly for uh, the rec side of things. She's, she works for Georgia Rivers Network, which is a um, organization in Georgia that does really uh, two things education and access, which are two of the most critical things that we need for, for kayak fishing to continue to grow is access to water. Uh, and then education, making sure that everyone is, is safe and, and knows, you know, getting your beginners out there so that they have good, successful first experiences, you know, kayak fishing, um, so that they don't have something, you know, they don't, flip it and think, oh, it was miserable. I'm going to go, you know, play disc golf now for the rest of my life or something other than, you know, we want to keep them doing this. So the education component is, is an important part of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it'll be a thing. I'm actually going to teach my classes. Uh, I think the Sunday after each of the kayak adventure series, I'll stick around an extra day. And I think I can do um, up to five people per class. And I know, you know, Russ and Drew and everyone else is going to do it as well. So, cool. Yeah, I'm curious I, I, to see what just, uh, what Wade does with it with his role at, at Yak Attack. It'll be good too. But you were going to say, yeah, just thinking about it, having been in the military, we did a safety brief before everything. I wonder why in tournaments they don't do a safety brief of hazards, like known hazards on the water certain you know so you know jay karshman did that a couple years ago just in terms of of a breakdown of hey here's what you need to know for each section here here are your big rapids here are the things that you got to worry about um he, okay. he didn't go so far as to like list out each of like the crazy crackhead homeless encampments in in harrisburg that should have been on the hazard list um but jody queen did one for the hobie BOS for the the new last yeah. last summer. So uh, you know, you you definitely need it for river tournaments. Yeah, because there, there'll be people that are not not river anglers that that want to want to have a fun experience and uh, and know need to know. Hey, I'm I'm just I'm not going to do a float trip. Where's yeah. a safe place for me to pull into this pool and catch some fish? You know. Um, but yeah, that's another sort of delineation of, you know, I, I talked about throw and go, I don't want to say versus cause, cause the smart people are doing both versus, you know, the trailer boats with everything, all the bells and whistles, but it's also like, I say versus river. I hate that. Like ideally we have river guys taking non-river guys under the wings saying, Hey, let's, let's do this float trip. I know where we're going. Let's, we're, we're going to talk about the right way to, to run through a wave train. You know, how are you picking the line? You can follow my line through here. Uh, you know, if, if we're teaching each other, you know, that's what we want. We want each of us to be more adept at a variety of different environments. And the same thing with, you take a guy that knows whitewater and rivers and you put them out in big water. It's, it's got its own unique set. I know that when I started fishing the Chesapeake Bay for our striper, I'm like, this is way more than a handful on certain days than a river is. It just is like just the, the crazy tides and, and how big that water gets. So, but I don't know that that one that video you did with Chuck. That I mean, I grew up, you know, down on the coast, and man, that I would not. I grew up going out in stupid stuff, and that was to me that so was way beyond anything I would do. Yeah, 
Here's the weird thing, though. Um, <clears throat> he told me the wind forecast, and I said, we're not going. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you say it's going to be blowing 25. If it's blowing 25 on the Chesapeake Bay, it, it's all white caps. It's all breaking waves, right? Mm -hmm. We had that today. Um, there's no way I'd even think about it. I start thinking about it, you know, when we get down to like 12 mile an hour wind, it's a handful. The difference is on Erie, it's 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 bowl shaped. Uh, Whereas on rollers. In the Chesapeake, there's all these little shallow areas and turns and it's always changing. Um, you get up to three foot waves on the Chesapeake in a kayak. And once it gets it gets a little bit beyond three footers, they're going to be breaking somewhere and they're going to be breaking nasty where it goes from like 40 feet up to like eight. Like it'll flip you. Um, the frequency of the waves on Erie that day, and I know it's different in different days and different wind directions, was such that they were just they were not frequent. Like you had a long time of going up it wow. and then coming back down it. Whereas, you know, like we just don't get seven. I don't think we get seven footers on the bay. I don't know. Like if, if it's going to be much more than two and a half, I don't want to be out there, but because they're the frequency of waves is tighter. It's more choppy. Yeah. It's wave, 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 you know? So the, the bottom, they say the bathymetry, but what the bottom is like really matters. And, uh, you know, that morning we get out and I'm like, I'm, you know, like we're not going. And we get out of that, that past that break wall. And I look at it and he's like, see, I'm like, yeah, I see. This is fun. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go. And it, and it was fun. It was fun. It got a little dicey towards the end of the day, and, and that's when I put the camera away. But the worst of that day, I didn't film it. I put the camera away. And, uh, mm. We we were being chased off it because they were starting to, to break pretty consistently, you know, as it got it got worse. But, uh, you know, it was a fun experience. It worked out. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate it. And where can everybody go to find Boondocks? I guess you and <clears throat> so I I publish my rigging and kayak fishing adventures and in road life and so many other things um on on my YouTube channel. It's the little stuff. As in it's the little stuff that makes the difference between fishing and catching. I really try to get the details. And I'm gonna use, you know, Kurt as an example. I got some really good details of how he won the national championship some years ago how he rigged you know the the big trd <clears throat> that detail that little detail that you know that's the little stuff that makes the difference um i will be publishing all the rigging on and you'll be able to see the new stuff that uh that we're coming out with um you know with boondocks and just the boondocks youtube channel um on instagram it's jeff little kayak fishing and uh I would, you know, on Instagram, you're getting stuff as it's happening more often. Um, you know, like on this road trip, you'll you'll see where I'm at, you know, and me posting reels or whatever it is at at the shops as it's happening. Uh, whereas the YouTube, it usually, I don't know. Sometimes I publish the same day it happens, but usually there's a there's a delay. So, um, but yeah, Jeff Little Kayak Fishing on on Instagram and uh, the little stuff on YouTube. But I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, man. Thank you. Look forward to, I want to see all this stuff you're kind of teasing with the yeah. stand in your truck. And I'm, oh, that sounds exciting because boondocks, I know I've owned a bunch of your stuff and look forward to buying more in the future. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. I look, I look forward to seeing what comes out, man. Cool. I got to come see you. I, yeah. I know I'm going to do a um, an Ohio run at some point, you know, 
but I said, you know, let me let me start down south. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me enjoy some warm weather in January. But uh, yeah, that's right. I'm definitely going to come see you. So right on, yeah, right on. Cool. Right. If you need anywhere to eat down in Biloxi or uh, New Orleans, let let me know. I'll hook you up. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, All right. Guys. Thanks for listening, everybody. See y'all next week.